the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And with your spirit. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. So welcome to the third Sunday of Easter. And a, and a special welcome to Dr. Leslie Thompson of the Urban Theology Unit. We had a few conversations, haven't we, over the phone? And um, she has a long list of letters after her name. Uh, she is a lay reader and a lay chaplain and has a pie in, has a finger in many pies, I think. <laughs> Well, we can't hold that against you, although I'm not a Yorkshireman, so I'm south of the south of Yorkshire. And welcome to any visitors and to anyone joining us online. We're also online today. I do know that because I have a friend in a part of Cambridge who is a big screen. She's probably streaming that. Oh, okay. Streaming it. Streaming it. So we're just going to send the children out to the Sunday school. So who's going to hold the Bible? Ready? Who's going to hold the candle? Is it Seth? Well, that's it, hold the bottom. And you're going to hold that. <laughs> Jacob. That's right, isn't it? Where's Arthur then? So to prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries, to receive Jesus in word and sacrament, to be fed by him, let us first call to mind our sins, praying for grace, mercy, and a new beginning. I confess to Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, Pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
let us pray. Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments, they delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and thou seest it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and thou takest no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a man to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a rush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away from the midst of you the yoke, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out from the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire with good things and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters fail not and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. The word of the Lord.
reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, You girded yourself and walked where you would. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you would not wish to go. This he said to show by what death he was to glorify God. And after this he said to him, Follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. I'll just check I'm wired for sound. Is that fine? Can you hear me? Brilliant. Shall we pray? Today, Heavenly Father, may we find the strength and the inspiration to walk alongside those who need us most. Point them out to us. Let us see them. May we see you in them and answer your call. For the glory of your Son and the blessing of your name. Amen. Amen. Firstly, may I thank Father Keith for his kind invitation. And I'm looking forward to meeting you. I have come from just outside Liverpool this morning. So if I drop off to sleep in the middle of this sermon, you'll understand. If you drop off to sleep in the middle of this sermon, I will be greatly offended. (laughs) Let me start with a story. A long, long time ago now, when I was studying at Theological College, the administrator was concerned about the lack of input into the honesty box relative to the amount of fruit missing from the fruit bowl. (coughs) In an attempt to increase the quantity or maybe the quality of the donations, I'm not quite sure which, she placed a sign next to it and it said, Jesus is watching you. Now, as it happened, it came to be the principal's birthday. His wife, Grace, bless her, was well known for her baking skills, and he brought in the most enormous chocolate birthday cake, covered with additional chocolate, which dripped down the sides. You know the kind of icing I mean, I'm sure. It was a positive, heavenly deliciousness of chocolate gorgeousness. John, the principal, having a rather delightful sense of humour, put a notice beside it and it read, It's my birthday, help yourself. Jesus is watching the fruit bowl. (laughs) Actually, now I think about it, I'm not so sure he was. I rather fancy Jesus was celebrating with John and with us. 
let me tell you, that chocolate cake did not last long. And I think it rather brings me to the heart of what I want to say this morning and why I've chosen two passages which at first seem totally unconnected to each other, but actually aren't. What I want to suggest is that one is talking to a community, in this case, us, and the other to an individual, in this case, Peter, but really it could be any one of us but that the outcomes are essentially the same and are outlined rather more clearly in the Isaiah passage. I'm going to suggest what they might be in sort of broader terms and how we can see them for ourselves. So, here goes. A bit of background to Isaiah 58, which is set when the posh and religious part of the Jewish community returned from the exile in Babylon. You see, they didn't return to a wasteland. Those Babylonian exiles didn't return to an empty land. Much of the sort of ordinary population, you know, the folks like you and I, had been left behind to get on with it. And the priesthood, and the educated sort of thought that they could sort of walk back in and go, hey guys, we're back. <laughs> and go straight back to the way things had been in the times prior to the exile. Aren't you glad to see us? Well, frankly, no. <laughs> things didn't work out quite the way they had expected them to from the point of view of those who had come home. They were forced rather to exert their authority. And during the exile, they had developed their rituals and their fast days to the nth degree. And the result was a plethora of fast days and quite frankly, outright injustice, which is what Isaiah is pointing out here. One echelon of society had isolated themselves completely from the rest. Oh, not starting to sound familiar anyway, is it? <laughs> Never mind. Here, the rich had cut themselves off from the ordinary people, from the poor, and religion had come become detached from holiness. Justice had separated itself from mercy. And that's something that's never found in the nature of God. And Isaiah points all of this out in no uncertain terms. The systems of religion had become separated from the values of faith. Actually, I think that's a constant challenge for all churches. And I'm going to say nothing more than that. Well, at least for the time being. We're perhaps more familiar with the background to the reading that concerns Peter this morning, aren't we? Peter, well, he'd definitely blown it. The last time we heard him speak in the gospel narrative, it was to deny ever having known Jesus at all. Despite having been Jesus' best mate, despite having the guts to say out loud that Jesus was the Messiah when nobody else would, he had blown it out of simple fear. Sheer fear of, oh yeah, a kitchen maid. <laughs> he had run away and locked himself in an upstairs room. He wasn't stood at the foot of the cross like John or even the women. He was miserable, remorseful, 
wiping his eyes, Peter. Maybe if he could have found a tree, he'd have been up there like Judas. But he wasn't brave enough. Bolshy, mousy Peter has become the cowardly lion. Maybe we all have a streak of Peter in us, you know. It's far too comfortable sometimes to let Jesus down when the going gets tough. Oh, we've all done it, haven't we? To retreat into our comfortable churches, our locked rooms, and reassure ourselves somehow that if we feel enough remorse, then somehow everything will be all right. But that's not quite what Jesus says, is it? I'm going to start with us. That's you and I as individuals and look at what Jesus says to us and to Peter. Do you love me, he says, then feed my sheep. Do you love me, he says, take care of my sheep. Do you love me, Jesus asks insistently, then feed my sheep. Now I know from speaking to a lot of clergy over a lot of years, that they see this as part, at least, of their call to ordained ministry. And I'm not about to knock their interpretation, for God speaks to different people in different ways. But Jesus spent a lot of time talking about lost sheep and straying sheep. And I think we have to put all of this into context a little. Peter had heard all of that before. And this would have reminded him of all of it. You can feed sheep by throwing a bucket of whatever it is that the sheep like to eat over the wall of the pen and walking away, you know. But you cannot take care of sheep unless you get to know them and have a genuine concern for each one. Sheep tend to look a little bit alike. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. Until you get to know them. And spotting ticks is really hard unless you get up close. But they make a sheep's life really difficult, so I'm told. And what, is what, and what if one is missing? Going and searching for it is vital, because if a sheep falls over, it can't get up on its own. It's called casting. And then the crows will come and peck out its eyes while it's still alive, because the sheep is helpless. Yes, caring for sheep means getting right in there among them. And that's what we're called to do, each and every one of us. And it's very clear that we are all, Christian or not, made in the image of God. That's what the Bible tells us, isn't it? It can be hard to spot, I know, because, you know, I've met some people where we struggle to see the image of God in them. But it is up to us to strive to see it in one another. And when it comes to sheep, that can be hard work. Because sheep can be smelly and fairly obnoxious animals. But that is nonetheless what we are called to do. Now, having got the sheep stuff out of the way a bit, I want to return to the Old Testament and do a bit of speculation based on the end of the Isaiah passages to think about what our church communities might look like 
if we as communities of people who do the sheep stuff hang on in there. Let's remind ourselves of the last couple of verses of that Isaiah passage. Your light will rise in the darkness. Your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with homes. I'm going to suggest now that in such a time as this, we need more than ever to become a church community, such as the one that Isaiah describes. What's more, I'm going to be even more specific and argue that there are four specific qualities we can search out and discern that will tell us if we're moving in the right direction. And they're based on the research that I've been doing here in Sheffield. They're based on my findings from talking to the churches in Sheffield and one in Liverpool, where I tried out my questions before I asked them in Sheffield. <laughs> so the first quality a church community has to possess to be like this community that Isaiah describes is hope. The we've tried that before mentality simply doesn't wash. We can't do that is another one. We haven't, shouldn't, whatever unt you're thinking of is simply an excuse. If something fails, it's just a learning opportunity. We have to be hopeful, daring and brave to get in there with them their sheep. So let's start with a quote from one of those people that I spoke to in Sheffield. It's like looking at the night sky. First, you see one star and then another one, and another one. It's about being a sign of hope in the darkness. That really inspired me. We're not quite a never failing spring in the noonday sun yet, but we're getting there. To live by hope is to believe that it is worth taking that next step that our actions, our families, our churches, and our societies have meaning, are worth living and dying for. In a sense, it is hope that gives us energy, simply to keep the feast. It is hope that enables us to keep on feeding them their sheep, and to keep loving and caring for them. Paul reminds us that we should be able to account for the hope that we have, perhaps even in the middle of a world that sees hope draining away. I've already referred to the second characteristic I think we should be seeking in our dealings as a church community, and that's the search for justice and righteousness. In the Old Testament, this pairing of justice and righteousness is never separated. And it forms part of the nature of God. And in God's eyes, justice is not the kind of blind, impartial justice that we think of today. You know, this what lady on the old bailey with her eyes blindfolded, the scales and the sword. It, he, God, has a bias towards the poor towards the marginalized and towards the outcast. 
the restoration of God's proper community is an indication of the restoration of God's proper righteousness and justice for the oppressed in the Isaiah passage. And since God's nature, well, is to be perfect and unchanging, do we actually think that this is anything less than we should be seeking for our own communities here? and for our own church community. I am a little notorious, I have to own up, for once having written. If a child with autism is removed from a church service for being disruptive, then in a sense, Jesus goes with them and the rest of the congregation carries on worshiping in ignorance of that fact. Yeah, I was being a bit bolshy. I'll admit it. But it earned me a distinction. Who do we truly make welcome? Who would we honestly rather not have in our churches? That is, if we're being brutally honest with ourselves. Are we just a teeny, weeny, 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 weeny bit too comfortable? How can we hope to be transformative if it doesn't apply to us? God's righteousness involves us as well. And it may well involve a little repentance and a change of attitude on our part. It certainly seemed to be a precondition for the scenario of experiencing the peace and spiritual prosperity, or even literal prosperity outlined in those last couple of verses from Isaiah. I found when I was talking to the various churches in both Sheffield and Liverpool, that when I interrogated myself about how I was feeling, while the various interviews, interviewees were talking, I felt a sense of integrity in what they were saying. It was, without doubt, a huge honour to talk to them. And it's the reason I'm here today at Father Keith's invitation to explore some of my findings with you. And I think the fourth thing I found was this sense of authenticity, this integrity. Uh, the Bible, unsurprisingly, has a word for it. <laughs> it's about the lived experience of a deep inner peace, which does not deny the possibility of unhappiness being a part of it. It's called shalom in Hebrew. This shalom, this integrity or wholeness or serenity, the Hebrew word is impossible to translate in a single English word, alike those other two believed to be part of the nature of God himself, mishpat and siddhaka, justice and righteousness. In striving to care for them, their sheep, people come to experience this shalom quality, no matter how tricky it was. And do you know what? It's contagious. During the research, it was evident that churches are seeking ways of restoring this integrity, this wholeness to their communities by enhancing physical and mental well-being, by providing opportunities for spiritual growth and reconciliation, by offering real and genuine friendship, and so on. All of these are things that build shalom, and are therefore activities that are in accordance with the will of God for humanity. 
So there are my four qualities. What might we look for more specifically? I'm a nurse. I've been nursing 40 oh dear, years. I like symptoms. I like rushes, I like spots, I like temperatures, I like things I can measure. So let's look at things I can measure. And the first sign I'm going to suggest is that we celebrate together. I like celebration. I'm good at parties. Remember the chocolate cake. They feast together, whether that's a chocolate cake or a cup of hot chocolate, a warm drink in winter, or as Isaiah implies, a cool one in summer. Eating and drinking together is a huge community builder, isn't it? It's a way of valuing people and they tend to recognize it. So why not have a celebration? Think of the wedding at Cana, the feeding of the 5,000. I think God enjoys the celebration. We have a God who delights in his children. The second side, the gift of friendship. And I saw that writ large in so many of the projects that were spoken about. Friendship crosses boundaries of age, of disability, of gender, of sexuality, of anything. We can offer it freely and bountifully. It brings hope to the lonely to the isolated, to the marginalized. One person described herself as one project's pet pagan. I love that. But she's going to church now. <laughs> Another chap at a different church who apparently is an avowed atheist. You know the type, don't you? He's ended up asking for prayer. Why? Why? Well, I can tell you the answer to why. Because they were among friends. This has nothing to do with rampant evangelism, shoving the Bible down anybody's throat, or anything like that. It has simply to do with genuine friendship and the gift of hospitality. Is that beyond any of us? It's about getting to know and care for them, their sheep, no matter how tatty their coats look or how long their hooves have grown. And maybe not lastly, there is the sign of worship and blessing. When we see our community being touched and transformed in these ways. When we see our lives as Christians touching the lives of others with these kinds of opportunities, surely the proper response is worship because we are being blessed. And we get into what I mentally term the blessing worship cycle we see our lives and the lives of others being transformed by the grace of God and our response is worship, so we become more blessed. And so it goes on. I, just as a note, introduced an idea from one of the projects that I heard about in Sheffield in my own home church and the last one we held, we had 80 children, 80 teenagers between 11 and 16, coming through the door on their way home from school for a hot chocolate. That was week four. That's not bad. Is it? First week was 50, second week was 60, third week was 
70, was it, Ninian? Yeah. Roughly? Yes, and the fourth week was 80. Wow. They didn't know the church existed before we started. From zero to 80 in four weeks. Hot chocolate on your way home. What a place to build from. Free hot chocolate. You fancy a drink on your way home? No more than that. No agenda. Not bad, eh? And if you forget all the Hebrew, all the complicated stuff, I guarantee you'll remember the chocolate cake. And now, to God be the glory in the church, in our lives, in the lives of those whom we touch with our lives, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, now and forever. Amen. And may God bless you. No, I'm not clever enough to be able to switch it off. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Creed, as we say together, I believe in God. The In peace, let us pray to our Heavenly Father, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the gifts we have received from you and for your church throughout the world. We pray for the Church of England, for our diocese, our deanery and our parish, thinking of all who have worshipped at St Mary's through the centuries. We pray for our congregation, our church family, that in love and faith, we may welcome all who seek your peace and your love for us. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for Father Keith, Father Loxley, giving thanks for all their work and care at St. Mary's. We pray for Dr. Thompson, Father Joe and Ben, and all training for the priesthood. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Loving Lord, we pray for our troubled world, its peoples and their leaders, especially for our government and the problems they face in this time of uncertainty and unrest. We pray for all who have lost their lives or whose lives are changed forever by war, hatred and violence especially the victims of crime. We pray for peace in the Holy Land and in Ukraine, for humanitarian aid for Gaza, and that a safe and welcoming home be found by refugees. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear us. Lord of all, we ask your blessings on the church in Zimbabwe 
and Father Nicholas, the children in the Holy Land and Ian Mills with ACIC, and on all the world's suffering children. Please bless and protect all Christians who are persecuted for their faith and who risk their lives to meet for worship. We pray for Sat 7 as they broadcast, often in danger, to bring faith and hope to many thousands of believers in the Middle East and North Africa. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear us. Father of all, we pray for His Majesty King Charles, for the Princess of Wales and all the royal family. Bless our families, friends and neighbours, and all who live or work in Hansworth. We pray for people who have no family, the isolated, the lonely, all who live in fear, and those for whom life has no meaning. We ask your blessings on Eliza Lydia, her family and friends, at her baptism today. Lord, hear us. Merciful Father, we pray for all in any kind of need, for the sick in body, mind or spirit, and all nearing the end of life. We pray for all who give aid, care and comfort, or work to diagnose and cure disease. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear us. Father of all, we pray for all who have died, especially for our loved ones from whom we are parted for a while. In the year's mind, we remember and pray for Brian Wright, Arnold Garner, Edmund Murray, and Norma Watson. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. The blessed sacrament lamp burns for those on end of life care. Let us now offer our personal prayers to our Heavenly Father, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear us. Sharing in the joy of Mother Mary, we commend ourselves, these prayers and the parish to God as we say, And Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then they were glad when they saw the Lord. Hallelujah. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer one another the sign of peace.
pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Receive, O Lord, we pray, these offerings of your exultant church. And as you have given her cause for such great gladness, grant also that the gifts we bring may bear fruit in perpetual happiness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, a duty and a salvation. At all times to acclaim you, O Lord, but in this time above all to laud you yet more gloriously, when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Through him the children of light rise to eternal life, and the halls of the heavenly kingdom are thrown open to the faithful. For his death is our ransom from death, and in his rising the life of all has risen. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, Every land, every people exalts in your praise. And even the heavenly powers with the angelic host sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. Indeed, holy, O God, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dew fall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ending, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood 
the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. As we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Father, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis the Pope, Bartholomew the Ecumenical Patriarch, Stephen of Beverly, our appointed bishop, or the clergy and people of God. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed Apostle Saint Mary Magdalene and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Saviour's command, formed by divine teaching, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ.
the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
pray. <clears throat> Living God, your Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith that we may see him in all his redeeming work, who is alive and reigns now and forever. Amen. Do you sit for a moment? <clears throat> I'd like to thank Dr. Thompson, particularly today, and I think God has a wonderful sense of humor, because there was something you were saying, and it was just so spot on. It was unreal. Anyway, so part of the reason for us having Dr. Thompson today was because she wrote a report, as she said, about the churches in Sheffield, and of course we were in it. And the hub influences our social engagement very much in the parish, which is a good thing. Worship without good deeds is fairly meaningless, I think. Good deeds without worship, hmm, where does the inspiration come from? It should come from God. Anyway. I published the bands of marriage between Nathan John Doherty and China Sophia Roberts, both of the parish of St. James Woodhouse, to be married here. If any of you know cause or just impediment why these two persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony, ye are to declare it. And this is for the second time of asking. Oh, okay. No objections. And then we've got a few people to be confirmed in a fortnight. And as usual, we have this sort of enrollment thing where I give them a booklet and they ans answer some questions. So who's being confirmed in a fortnight? Come on then, you two. Don't disappear, because I'm going to ask you a question in a minute. London? Don't disappear. I'm going to stand here, and you're going to face the people, because you're answering the question. That's it, face me. So in that booklet, there's a few things, some coat hangers, if you like, of the basics of Christianity, like the Lord's Prayer and the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. Well, first of all, I'm going to ask a question, and the answer's on the front. <laughs> <clears throat> what do you, and these are really deep questions, actually. What do you ask of the church? Right, we'll try it again, shall we? Yeah. What do you ask of the church? And what does faith give you? We can't buy it in Meadow Hall or any other place. Eternal life is the gift of our Christian faith. Thank you. Oh, I've got to say a prayer. Does he mean? I'll just say this prayer for them. Father God, even before they were born, you called them and named them. Even before they understood, you sought and summoned them. All this time you have been choosing them, Lord, in secret and intimate ways. Now you call them to stand before you, before your people, to be elected by your church, to be prepared to be confirmed in your spirit, to be chosen by you for the world to see. Grant them courage to answer your call boldly and faithfully, to give glory to your holy name through praise and service, through the power of the Holy Spirit and in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you please stand? The Lord be with you. 
And Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Joy to thee, O Queen of and be glad, O Virgin Mary, Alleluia. Let us pray, O God, who through the resurrection of thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, did vouchsafe to give joy to the whole world. Grant, we beseech thee, that through the help of his mother, the Virgin Mary, 
we may obtain the joys of everlasting life. Through Christ our Lord.